Walking have been virtually in this darkness or handed cages with cement, wire, or metal graded floors and live in their own feces. But the disabilities that arise from these toxic environments are often secondary to the ones that are, they are already made to have. Farmed animals are bred to physical extremes, where others produce too much milk for a cow's body to hold, where turkeys and chickens cannot bear the weight of their own giant breasts, and where pigs are left with legs that cannot hold their weak weight. Chickens, turks, and turkeys, and ducks are also mutilated with processes such as de-beaking, which is done without anesthetic and which can leave them from a serious infection. It can make it very difficult for the birds to eat and clean themselves. All of this says nothing of the bruises, abscesses, sores, broken bones, vaginal and reproductive disorders, chronic illness, and psychological issues that commonly reported farmed animals endure. Disabled farmed animals are in, or disabled animals are in the media in another way besides this overcoming narratives. Outbreaks of mad cow disease, swine flu, E. coli, and, and other industrialized farmed animal diseases have led to countless headlines over the past few years, many focusing on the question of damned animals and whether or not they can be sent to slaughter. Non-ambulatory animals, as they are often called, are simply animals who for numerous reasons are unable to walk. Although this could be due to serious illness, more often than not, it's due to exhaustion, dehydration, weak and fragile bones, complications after childbirth, or simply falling. Horrific videos by various animal advocacy groups, including HSUS and Mercy for Animals, have shown animals being dragged by a single limb or kicked and beaten in an attempt to make them stand and walk to slaughter activities, which are often legal. One such video shows, quote, crippled pigs being hung to death by chains, which is not against the law either. Although the media does often mention the cruelty inflicted on these animals, it is the potential health risk posed to human beings that they become a part of the food supply that is sustained interest in the issue. In 2009, President Obama banned the slaughter of damned cattle because of the health risks they imposed on the public. Rather than being slaughtered, the sick and disabled of downed adult cattle are now supposed to be humanely euthanized. However, there are many loopholes. President Obama said in his weekly address, as part of our commitment to public health, our agriculture defense department has closed the loophole in the system to ensure that diseased cows don't find their way into the food supply. The bizarre wording of the statement, which presents non-ambulatory cows as purposefully trying to be consumed, brings up the historical associations of disability with the fear of contamination. The downed animal becomes a symbol of what is sick, dirty, and dangerous about industrialized farming. Separating the downed animal out reinforces the idea that the rest of the practice is safe, healthy, and even compassionate, despite the obvious reality that the industry itself is clearly the creator and perpetuator of these problems. There is a sort of pity for these animals, but only at a distance, and only if it is clear that they will not mix with, quote, normal and, quote, healthy cows, who, as we have seen, are neither actually healthy nor normal. In the end, they must be euthanized, a sort of missed mercy killing that, like the fox with Arthur Gacosta shot by the concerned hunter, allows human beings to still kill animals as we would anyway, upholding speciesism, while also fulfilling two of the most prominent responses to this attempting it. Well, also, um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, also pitying it, upholding animalism. As the damned animals show, the sympathy directed towards disabled farmed animals is secondary to the concern over human needs, and those needs are usually over profit. The advice given to farmers to protect their animals from disease and disability is nearly always financial. If you could go to the next slide. It seems impossible to consider the disabling effects that farmed animals experience as separate from environments. The mother pig is made utterly immobile not by a physical difference or disease, but by the metal bars of her gestation rate. The hen suffers from pain, but whether it's due to a broken leg, overcrowding, darkness, or the death of her cave paint, in many ways seems irrelevant. The dairy cow is euthanized not because she can't walk, but because she has become a symbol of contamination. The environments no doubt disable them even more than their physical and psychological disabilities do, a fact that supports that social model of disability. Trying to pinpoint disability disease in these environments is so less challenging than trying to ascertain what disability is and present among human beings. What does it mean to speak of a healthy, normal chicken or pig or cow and all the environments that are profoundly disabled? Indeed, when they are all bred to be disabled. Even so-called heritage breeds are often bred for characteristics that human beings, but notably later, disabilities or abnormalities. 
Consider the midget white, your feet, the pen, the pink, oh, it, oh, deals over when start, and slow food U.S. A says, sounds more like a side joke than the centerpiece of a barbecue. The issue of breeding itself raises all sorts of complex questions about policy, naturalness, and boundaries between discipline and enhancement. Animals, enhance, but not for It's too loud. It's got to come down. Do you have to do our microphone? Of the 60 billion animals that are killed every year, human beings. Many are literally manufactured to be disabled, bred to be mute produced to meat, milk, and eggs. And none of this has anything with the other end of other animal industries. Animals in fur farms, research labs, services, and experience a variety of different conditions and issues that well or play due to captivity, poor care, abuse, or breeding. What do we make of the fact that the leading reason for euthanasia in captive elephants is arthritis? What about the huge number of animals from factory farms to zoos to research labs to circuses who show signs of mental illness, hysteria, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, or madness? No doubt all of this raises profound ethical concern over the ways non-human animals are treated, or more aptly, mistreated by human beings. And it's hard even to begin to consider what disability means in these instances because of how inseparable it becomes from captivity, from abuse, from neglect, from breeding, and yes, from suffering. What does disability mean for a hen who is in an environment where her every movement and desire is neglected? What does a physical limitation or difference mean when you are given no opportunity to move in your own body, to explore it, because your environment is already limiting everything about you? Perhaps, as with many disabled human beings, these animals' disabilities are the least of their worries. Unlike with Mozu or the fox with arthrogryposis, there is no projected disability empowerment here, not in these environments. I cannot find it anywhere, because as soon as I imagine these animals embodying their disabilities in ways other than suffering, or, imagining, or imagine them fostering new ways of interacting or perceiving, I have imagined them out of the factory farm or research lab. This shows the extent to which so much of the suffering and marginalization of disability is social, is built, is structural. But what happens to these animals when by some sheer stroke of luck they escape or are removed from these environments? I asked Jenny Brown this question. Brown is founder of the Woodstock Farm Sanctuary, author of The Lucky Ones, and is a disabled person herself. Brown's response to my question was that it really depends on the extent and variety of disability. She told me about some animals whom, despite their best efforts, they decided they had to euthanize. Others learned how to adapt on their own or were supported by their fellow, fellow creatures. These stories raise many questions about disability scholars and advocates. For disability scholars and advocates, how are we to consider animal euthanasia, for example? What does interspecies interdependence tell us not only about animal emotion, but about non human experiences of disability? These stories also raise questions about accommodation and access. What are our responsibilities to accommodate and support these animals whom we have made disabled? What does accommodation and access even mean for different species? The disabilities created in these animal industries, disabilities born of speciesism and cruelty, complicate my understanding of disability. I am left with questions about suffering, a topic that disability scholars have rightfully tried to move away from. Disability activists and scholars have worked for decades to challenge the notion that disability equals suffering. Rather, we have argued that much of the suffering around disability stems from the discrimination and marginalization that disabled people face. This has not been done to erase suffering, but to broaden the conversation around what experience of disability can be. While disability advocates have often pushed away from narratives of suffering, it is everywhere within animal ethics scholarship. A huge amount of work has been done by animal activists simply to prove that animals can suffer. And much work has sought to explain why human beings should care about this fact. Suffering is an inevitable part of, of the conversation around animal industries, as well as around disability within these industries, and for good reason. However, animals are too often presented simply as voiceless beings who suffer. Exploring these issues through the lens of disability studies can help us to ask who these animals are beyond their suffering. It asks us to consider how the very vulnerability and difference these animals inhabit may in fact embody new ways of knowing and being. The title of this talk is Animal Crips, but what does it mean to call an animal a crip? Can animals be crips? The word crip, of course from cripple, has been adopted by disability scholars and activists in a way similar to how LGBT scholars and activists have reclaimed the word queer. 
Many disabled people identify as Crips. To Crip something does not mean to break it, but instead to radically and creatively invest it with disability history, politics, and pride.